Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm talking today with Armando. Hello. Hey there. Hello. How are you doing, Chris? It's it's great to have you. And as we were kind of talking before we got started, it's like you're you're down for the part of the world, like where I was, you know, born and raised, down from you're on the outskirts of the Bay Area, but you, I still consider that area Fairfield Cordelia is kind of the far eastern reaches of the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, people around, around here, they say that it depends what's convenient. We call, we call ourselves a North Bay, sometimes just in the Sacramento area, depends on the convenience. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's this beautiful area. I was just down there like a month ago and driving all around. And we went and saw like the Muir Woods and went up in the peninsula across down in San Francisco. And, you know, but of course out in the valley and visited family, stayed with family out in Folsom. And, you know, so still... It's, it's great knowing where everything is, but, at, you know, being, having been gone, moved away from California in 2004, it's hard going back and seeing everything so developed. It's super developed. This area here, uh, just this past Christmas, um, this house where I'm, uh, where I'm living in, it's about, uh, I think, 25 years old. And this Christmas, I was going out for jogging, and this family just stopped by and said, oh, I used to live in this house, and there was just like a half a dozen houses around here. And uh, down the concrete on the parkway, they got this kid's, uh, uh, you know, hand impression. It was yeah. his. The guy oh, wow. married and two kids. And th that was my hands. <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. But, you know, so Cordelia, for those that don't know, it's right at the junction of Highway 80, so which goes coast to coast in the U.S., uh, and 680, which goes down through Walnut Creek. And, and oh, so it's a major, frozen. yeah, so major, it, it, you know, it goes down through Benicia and, and across to the, the bridge and stuff. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, I remember as a kid driving past and going to the nut tree and going to, you know, Fairfield and Vacaville and, and up into Sacramento, there were three gas stations. It was, that was it. It was a trucking stop. <laughs> there was nothing else there. And now it's just built in every direction around that. But, but anyway, I, Hey, it's great to have you here. And, uh, so why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Who are you? Where are you? Well, we've talked about where you are, but I'm what you do. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, well, um, again, I'm Armando Lacerda, and uh, I was born in Brazil. I came to US back in 2001. I've uh, been working with Microsoft Technologies for, you know, since forever. <laughs> and when I got here, uh, I was a certified trainer, and there was a huge demand back then before the dot-com bubble burst for trainers. So that's how I've, I got my, my first uh, uh job here in the US and we always working on the data side of things and start as a developer long ago, like three lives ago, and then work on mainframes and um, got into uh, the database side of, side of things and mainframes. When I got to the next project was in Oracle and uh, back then SQL Server was like SQL Server 6, 6.5, yeah, yeah. it was not really, really a big a, a tool, a, a usable tool for data warehousing. It was okay for LTP, but not for data warehousing. And then Microsoft came along with SQL Server 7.0, and they went around Brazil. They were like, you know, we need people to uh, evangelize this thing in here. So we are uh, promoting uh, the product. would like to join the team and uh, as a trainer. And I got seduced by the dark side of the force. <laughs> I joined uh, the SQL Server team down there and never looked back. So we worked with SQL Server since then. Um, yeah, I've been in Florida Day for about 10 years and then moved here to California. You know, it's it's funny. I, I've, I've commented a few times that so I like it, in the in the 90s worked in data warehousing. And in fact, I had a number of projects. I joined the phone company, formerly known as Pacific Bell in California, um, and it was based there in, uh, in in San Ramon and then Pleasanton for for several years. Uh, but, you know, working with it, one of them was the first, one of my big projects was this data center consolidation. So we actually consolidated, I don't know if you knew, like the, the phone company had a massive data center right next to the Jelly Belly factory in Fairfield. Oh, there. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So it's literally, they share a par uh, parking lot with the, the uh, our data warehouse, our buildings there. Um, and so I did a consolidation of, of three different data centers out of uh, Rancho Cordova, or Sacramento area, one down in, I think, Irvine, and then one in Hayward to the Fairfield facility. Um, but 
we didn't touch much Microsoft technology. I mean, we were using Office and other tools and stuff, but on the enterprise side, it, there was no Microsoft technology. We were on old SGI servers and, and we upgraded to HP servers. We were dealing with, uh, you know, a number of systems, none of which were Microsoft, but yeah, that was back in the, I did like some Unix training, which, well, that's that, useless. That, that's what I'm about to say. The things that are running our cell phones today were used to use to run those servers back then. <laughs> I always remarked is that I did one massive marketing database and we, we were, uh, it was it was huge and when we were getting ready to migrate it and update it with some gis data and it was going to be 1.2 terabytes in 1995 that That's was a, a big deal right <laughs> yeah yeah it was like it was like whoa and now i have a six terabyte external drive that i <laughs> only have music on so <laughs> I remember back then, uh, early 90s down there in Brazil, uh, their warehousing was like 10, 20 gigabytes. Yeah. And a SQL Server was not able to handle those things. Only Oracle back then, sec seven something, um, was the product that could handle that, that massive amount of data. When SQL Server 7.0 came around, it was like, oh, we can handle like three terabytes of data. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I know. I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's fun to go back and look at that. Some of that stuff. I still have a lot. I've got a box in the garage. It's one of those things where my wife is like, why don't you throw this out? And a lot of Microsoft people have that where I have discs from releases of products that no longer exist. I mean, I have a drawer that I've got four or five zooms in, you know, but uh, it's fun to go back and I hang on to some of that stuff. Um, one of the things I used to run, uh, uh, you know, help, run like SharePoint Saturday events on Microsoft campus. And one of my favorite things to do was to get Microsoft people to donate things to give away. And uh, it, in the offices there in, in Redmond, uh, it used to be that people would go and dump off like old computer books and things in the kitchen areas on each floor. And so I would go through and get access to those areas and find, hey, these people are throwing out these books. And we would give away these ancient books of, again, technology that was really grossly outdated. It was a, yeah. it was a lot of fun to do that. But Yeah, I, I remember like three years before COVID, I think, uh, I was down there in Microsoft for some conference. And back then they were uh, doing a reorg and the DX department division there was going away. Yep, I remember that. A lot of, uh, a lot of the perks there. But uh, it just remind me that down here uh, in, in Mountain View, they have the computer museum. And yeah. sometimes I take my, my daughters there and I show them, look, I started on this little TRS-108 here <laughs> or the Sinclair computer, super small. They have it there. I love it. Yeah, I, it's fun to go back and look at that stuff. I, I learned basic programming on a little amber screen pet computer in in sixth and seventh grade so yeah you know as, as an mvp we do a lot of talking and sometimes we have to kind of you know reflect a little about what topics we want to present and the other day i was putting together top one spark and i was like okay spark let's do some comparisons you know compute separate from storage whatever you do with the memory and it suddenly came to me, it was pretty much like how I started back in the 80s. You know, you have the cassette tape, you load into memory, you do your stuff, and then you write back to the cassette tape. So kind of the same idea, computers to computers, same way. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what was kind of, your, what was your path to becoming an MVP? Oh, um, well, <laughs> what's funny, I don't know if it happened to you, but a lot of my friends, they cross me and they're like, you're not an MVP yet? And I kind of felt depressed, you know, what, what expect? I, I don't have any handle on that one. I, I hold tons of certifications. Those I can, you know, it's under my control, but MVP think depends on you being noticed and people evaluate your work. So I, I think I was being evaluated for about three years, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, uh, I met Christian uh, at the SQL Saturday in Portland. Mm -hmm. And he was there and he saw one of my presentations there and evaluated my, my entire list of submissions. And then he was like, yeah, I'm going to submit your, your name to the team and we'll see if you get, if you get approved. And I did get the award that year was, was 99, was just the year before COVID. That's always, it, it's, it's a difficult thing where, where a lot of people that are especially technical people that uh, are kind of heads down doing the work they're involved in, even those that are in the community, um, 
where it almost seems like I have to kind of self promote. I have to like do something and you have to do it in a way that you're not like, look at me, you know, <laughs> you know, right. I, but you need to do it in a way that, that is a little bit more humility in, in that, but kind of give back. One of the common things that I hear from MVPs, and I say this again and again, is that, look, even if I didn't have the MVP award, I'd be doing these same things. I'd be writing, I'd be blogging, I'd be speaking. I, you know, for a couple of years, I was speaking at conferences, I hadn't really thought of much about the MVP. I was aware of the, of the program. And same, just like you, I was at a conference in Boston and I had two or three MVPs that were there. And they're like, well, how long have you been an MVP? I'm like, yeah, I'm not an MVP. They're like, <laughs> like you're presenting at all these conferences. You're writing all this content. Like you're doing all this stuff. How are you not an MVP? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. You see, I, I'm weak on that front. I, I don't write much. Uh, I, be, having a blog has been on my bucket list for like a, a 10 years or so. But then put one together. I really like to, to present it. I, I, like I said, I'm a certified trainer. I've been doing Microsoft yeah. training for 26 years. And I think one of the things that rendered me from getting the, to, to an MVP uh, before is because you have to do uh, voluntary contributions, right? You're not supposed right. to be paid for those things. And I, I love presenting. And because I love presenting, people like to hire me to teach them classes. But so those doesn't count. Right. <laughs> those right. don't count. So uh, yeah, when I stopped, uh, yeah, it was about three, four years ago when I decreased my, you know, I switched my hats a little, started doing more consulting, got find more time to present to user groups and conferences. It's when I got more noticed. Yeah. That's a great thing that for folks that don't know too, like your great point that the things that you're doing for your job, the things that you're being paid to go and do, those aren't contributions that you can submit as part of like, if you're being considered for that, it's, it's about the things that you're doing for the community above and beyond what your yeah. regular job is. I remember as I was a chief evangelist for a couple of ISVs and people would be critical. Oh, your company is paying for your time. I said, look, I true that I had the benefit of a company that supported the community activities would pay for my flights and hotels to go all over the world to go and speak with. I said, but the things that I was doing for the community, like I gave up, I think one year, I'm trying to remember if it was like 2013, 2014, I spoke at 18 SharePoint Saturdays in oh, a year. Wow. <laughs> so that's 18 weekends that I gave up, plus all the travel time, plus all of that. Plus I did have my day job and things to go and do. Mm -hmm. But throughout that, you know, they were my sessions, they were my time, they were neutral topics. I wasn't, a, you know, pitching for my company and writing and doing the other things. So it's like, like now, I mean, I, I blog, I present on and it's, I'm writing on weekends, on week, on evenings outside of my day job to do those community things. So those are the things that considered. Then I have yeah. a list of other things that I'm doing, which if I weren't being paid as part of my job to do it, you know, great content would be, you know, uh, fit right in with the rest of what I do, but it's part of my job. So I don't submit those things. Yeah, we're I mean, not supposed to. Well, uh, uh, I think I'm going to get close to your number this second half of the year. There are so many conferences coming up, especially on the data platform, uh, uh, you know, side of things. Um, I think the next one is Denver. Uh, uh, actually, no, Denver is September 17th, Secret Saturday in Denver. Uh, before that, I'll be in Chicago for that week. So I'm going to fly from Chicago to Denver. Um, there is Orlando, there is Dallas, there is there's a, Well, if there's somebody that doesn't have the funds to go on to, to the locations, like I, I prefer the in-person events over the online. Makes the two um, of us. Yeah. And, and, but I know that there are some that like can't or, or prefer just to do the virtual. There are now so many other virtual events. And I'll just say this. Hey, the, we, we call it the uh, Microsoft uh, user group, Utah or mug it which is an ugly <laughs> acronym, but um, it works. You know, I like it. <laughs> we're always looking for speakers. It's more collaboration topics. Um, so SharePoint teams and the like, uh, but you know, that there, there are user groups everywhere. So if you want to break into the space or if you're even an MVP currently, like you can do more. You don't have to get up from the couch. Yep. <laughs> just yesterday I, I was presenting for the local group here in the Bay Area with Mark Guinnabal and uh, he announced that the next meeting might happen on a physical location down there in San Francisco 
And if it does, it's going to be hybrid. So there'll be people in yeah. the room and it will be open for you know, whoever doesn't want to commute there. We're doing the um, same thing. We're hybrid. I, I was down there in LA for Sequel Saturday last weekend. And um, Steve told me that they, they don't plan to come in person anymore because driving around the lead is always horrible. And now that they are all comfortable doing remote, it's going to be remote. They don't plan to be in person anymore. Yeah. Uh, again, for, for us that prefer the in-person, I, I, like the relationship building, the connections that you make, the, the, the conversations, I mean, it's, I don't think you can replace it nope. by doing the virtual. It's, it's great when, uh, when you're not able to be there, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's so important to, to make those physical connections to, 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 to meet people. And yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. Anyway, Se I Saturday, to gotta, gotta be on premise again, uh, I mean, in person again, but, uh, dialy, it does make sense to do the user groups remote. <laughs> yeah. Anytime, well, you, anytime you yeah. open the, the map and you see the traffic there is all red, rubbish red. Every right. Time of the day. <laughs> well, and it, I just, I, I, I see a future of personal jetpacks that will solve all of the problems. <laughs> I heard that there was somebody testing that by the airport a couple months ago down there in LA. Did you see the news? <laughs> no. There, there was this pilot talking to the tower saying, look, there's a guy with a jetpack flying around here. <laughs> I, I bet the fine for that, if they caught him, was pretty hefty too. Probably. Probably. Yeah. They didn't get a guy. He flew so, what do you, so within the data platform, like, so what, what's your kind of your core focus? What's happening in that space? What's of interest? Yeah, see, I mean, my focus has always been SQL Server. I've been a SQL Server guy for 20 years and help companies, you know, you know, doing things faster in SQL, optimizing the platform, getting things to run better, to run faster, sometimes unlocking them. The, the, if you, actually, two years ago, there was this guy using Azure SQL in the cloud. And, you know, the company was there and, and all of a sudden the whole thing came to a crawl really, really mm -hmm. slow and was, you know, some settings on parallelism. So, Sometimes you get into those things, but the, the and SQL Server it seems is going to be around for a very long time. There was this uh, you know this fear uh, that the the DBA role will die, that SQL Server will go away because the cloud is cheap and all of that. I think everybody's at peace now. Microsoft has been showing that from all their products, SQL Server is the one that still have growing adoption on premise yeah. and, and the cloud. So you know. Yeah. Futures look, looks, looks bright for SQL. But what's really, really hot nowadays is on the data engineering side, uh, data transformation and uh, data cleansing, for especially for AI, yeah. uh, up in the cloud with cloud, uh, cloud uh, scalability. And um, Microsoft does have a product for that. I mean, in Azure Synapse, there's a particular engine called the dedicated SQL pool which you know, brings all your knowledge, you know, your expertise background in SQL Server and you can do compute at scale on that one. Mm -hmm. But the one that's come really strong, really uh, promising, I mean, it's already, it's, promising is not the right word because it's been around for a while, but it's getting more and more adoption is on the Spark side. So mm -hmm. on that side, you have Databricks, that's been, was the first one, the first big one. And you do have a similar engine inside Synapse, which is the Spark pool. So data engineering there. And the thing with that one that some people are having a hard time to move into is because that was developed the, that was the, developed for developers. So you do coding there. When you are in the SQL side of things and you do data transformation and you are familiar with integration service more likely, mm -hmm. and integration service is all visual. It's all graph user interface, drag and drop, parameters, drag arrows, and things like that. When you go into Spark, it's all code and mm -hmm. probably in a language that you have not dealt with yet, like Scala, uh, R, or if you're lucky, you can go into Python that's usually more, is more similar to uh, other traditional languages. But, um, but that, that's what is shining there. And on, on top of that, you also have the, uh, the Delta, Delta technology with Delta Lake and Delta tables. Mm -hmm. addressing the problem of immutable files but you need to do transactions so how do you do delta addresses that what's well, interesting you, you brought up too is but with the uh, data transformation uh, just cleanup and management of data is there there's always good well with all of the growth of ai and automation that's out there where you have the power platform and and you have these you know people going and building these 
small applications and, and everybody's learning this skill set to go and build for themselves, there's a greater and greater need for, you know, clean data and be sorted through organizations. It's like, I, I look, I'm not a, 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 an AI guy. I'm not, I don't work in that world anymore, you know, to, to that degree. Um, and so I'm kind of out of touch with the latest capabilities there. But what I do understand is for the people within my, my organization that are really talented with like Power BI and kind of the presentation layer of these things is that they make it look so easy, but there's so much work that has to happen to get the data ready and usable that they can go and do the presentation layer and make these usable dashboards and, and graphs and things. Um, and so there is a tremendous need for people that still that that know the data and manage and massage that data so that it's usable by, you know, the front office with these other applications like Power BI. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, back in the days we, when we have just SQL and it was on premise, uh, we had the clear division between transactional processing and analytical processing. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can get SQL Server, you got two boxes, one for each purpose. And you, uh, you know, capture your data on the transactional processing, and you copy that data over to the analytical processing, accumulate it over there, uh, in order to report. With the cloud scale and the amount of sources we have today, there, these two things are not so close anymore. Now they're very apart. And right in the middle is where you find uh, the data engineering and the AI um, elements that I just mentioned grabbing the data that's being produced by the transactional system, ingesting to the transformations, uh, creating those two artifacts, you know, better polished data, and also the statistical models to work with predictions on top of those data in order to be able to report at the front end that you mentioned. So it's funny, uh, uh, they created an, an abyss, which is the amount of data you have to process mm -hmm. and the scalability on that one in order to deliver your, your analyticals. Yeah, it's it's uh, I mean, so so many things that are that are different. I mean, I spent you know a lot of my time as a technical project manager um, back in the telecom year, so the the early to mid '90s, and it was you know customer internal customers would come and say, "Hey, we like this data set. This is fantastic, but we want to go and you know." modify the data add this these other things in there and be able to go and do the analysis it, it, you know, it would take us weeks to go in there and to integrate that in and you know chop that up slice and dice it feed it back through and we own the front end tools like business objects and data strategy and SaaS modules for them to go in and do their analytics on that but all of the work that was involved took weeks and weeks and weeks to get all that prepped just so that they could then go in and in a reasonable amount of time, put in a query, get a result back and actually show, you know, create reports and things on that. And yeah. now you've got the scale of the cloud. I mean, that just opened up. It changed so much of that world. Uh, which and it's is, amazing how, uh, how storage has made so cheap by the cloud. You know, it's so much cheaper to, to, to keep data that people usually just keep, you know, why throw the data away? It's so cheap to keep it them, uh, in, you know, in the storage. So let's just keep them and end up creating this Think, I don't know if you have heard of it. There is this um, kind of informal concept called the dark data. Hmm. And uh, the, the, the concept comes from uh, physics when you know, the, the uh, astronomers uh, analyzing the universe. So they say that like 70, 75% of the mass of the universe is not really detectable, you can see, but you can see the, eff the effects on everything else you can see. And, and they, dark, they call that the dark matter. <laughs> Here yeah. we call the dark data because it's this amount of data that companies decide to keep because they they represent something. They have right. they're, that data is not information yet, but it can become information at some point. So they just keep it there because it's so so cheap to keep right. the kind of cloud with this capability. Kind of well, you don't want to be. I mean, we ran into this era too, where we were trying to build like a, a, like a performance system, so we would remove data that we thought, hey, not really critical to what you're trying to do, and. And that was one of the pains is that then we'd, we'd remove something and somebody would ask, put in a request for something. We're like, oh, well, yeah, to be able to identify that, we need to go and add that data back in and, and sort through it. But, but now, that, I mean, to your point, I mean, the, the cost of storage dropped down so dramatically. But also, I think another thing that, that helped explode this space is, you know, the, is, is the scalability of the cloud. 
So to have things out in place, you're not as worried about the storage, but being able to also it's the compute capability on those massive amounts of data. So these are, I used to say that uh, uh, spending time when, when I started to see other vendors that were like, oh yeah, we're a big data platform provider. I'm like, yeah, every company is in the big data space. Every data problem is a big data problem because we're not throwing anything away because we don't know what might be useful somewhere in the future. What might correlate into some query that our customers, our internal customers need around this. So why get rid of it? Let's just store it. And so our data scientists can go back into it, you know, years from now and, oh yeah, hey, we, ha we have this data. Exactly. Yeah, we, we are at that age. Like I said, in the past, we used to uh, transform the data we have received and not keeping the original sometimes because it was just raw information, not much meaning there. Now we are at that, that stage where, no, we just keep everything. So if we need to do it again, we can go back to the original and see how it looked like at the beginning. Well, as a collector, I collect music and a few other things. There's a few artists, um, but I have thousands of CDs, thousands of vinyl records. Uh, and then of course, then digital, you know, all of that. And, um, I'm in a constant battle with my wife that to to um, to 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 justify myself as not being a hoarder uh, <laughs> in general. But uh, yeah, we are hoarders of information, and there's a, it's a very low cost you know barrier to yeah. keep data. It, it, it causes an explosion, and if not well governed, it, it can become a hassle. You know because you start looking it's like the FOMO thing you know the fear of missing out yep you look at all those files you know if you delete this thing what am i going to throw away <laughs> you're going to miss something but it, it can become a problem but um but definitely oh, it's better keep if it's not affecting the budget yeah we'll worry about performance later yeah yeah the thing about performance and like you said you know compute uh, and um like we discussed in the beginning right uh, with See, like when you when you look into SQL Server and Oracle and any other relational database, there they have their proprietary uh, file format. So when you store data, it's only for that data engine. With the data lake and the approach for open standards for compressed data and immutable data like Parquet files, uh, it's for any engine. So like when you look into Synapse in Azure, um, you the same repository can serve both the Spark pool, the serverless SQL pool, and if you want to, you can share with Databricks as well, and any other uh, engine that can read um, either Parquet by itself or in the data language. So you have you know, a plethora of options in terms of compute, and each one of them is scalable into multiple nodes with multiple capabilities per node, or computing capabilities per node. So this, the, 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 the separation between storage and compute and memory processing on those things it kind of a, is a throwback to the 70s and the 80s, but revolutionized the future of the design of uh, data engineering. Well, we could have a longer conversation and nerd out. I could tell you stories about I, I was involved in the Global Grid Forum as part of the Marketing Awareness Council for, for several mm -hmm. years and, and work with clients like uh, Cadence Design Systems and uh, building technology to manage um, compute farms. And uh, it, it's a fascinating era. It just seems so long ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it, was, it was 20 plus years ago, but uh, yeah, fascinating space. Well, Armand, I really appreciate your time today. For folks that want to find out more about you or get in contact, what are the best ways to reach you? Oh, best way is um, with LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. It's, it's perfect. I, I'm like I said, I'm trying to get a blog up, so I'm moving my space to another URL with another name, so that will be it will come up later. And I'm definitely going to post that on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, is, uh, as of today, is the, uh, the preferred place place to get connected and uh, follow along. I also uh, whatever I do on LinkedIn, I reflect so echoes out in Twitter. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's fine too. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time and, uh, you know, enjoy the, uh, the warm weather out there in, uh, in central California. Thank you, Christian, for having me. And once again, thank you. It's great to be here with you. And I got to tell you, uh, 
in Sacramento today is going to be one of four, but early this morning, it was raining here in my neighborhood. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, this has been like, we've been here in Utah for six years. This is the wettest summer we've had. I, I don't think it's impacting our drought. Like all the Western U.S. is experiencing serious drought, major yeah. drought. Uh, and I don't think this is hit because it, it, we need snowpack to impact ours. And it was a very dry winter. But uh, yeah, the monsoon rains has been fantastic because I go out for to walk the dog in the morning. And instead of being, you know, <laughs> at, at 11 a.m., instead of being 95, it's like uh, 78. Big difference. That's a nice walk in 78. Nice. Yeah. yeah, we're looking forward for the Pineapple Express in a few months. And hopefully we'll bring more water. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Have a good one.